Well, good evening and welcome to, to everyone. It's really wonderful to see such a big crowd. I'm Sandy Fredman. I'm a professor of law here at the Oxford University and director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub. And on behalf of the Oxford Human Rights Hub, I'm very happy to welcome you. We are joined tonight and we're very glad that we are co-hosting with the Bonavira Institute, with the Public Law Discussion Group, and with the programs for the, the program for the Foundation of Constitutional Law and Government. So we are, we are certainly in uh, epic times, and every day, twice a day, we hear momentous news, and not least momentous was the decision in the Miller case, which I'm sure you, you all followed with great interest. And certainly the responses to the Miller case have been extreme on both sides, as we see from this headline, um, some, some, some very um, biting criticism, to say the least, of both the judges and the judgment. Gina Miller, who brought the case, has been subject to death threats. She's been called a Brexit wrecker. Others have hailed the decision as uh, reinstating parliamentary democracy and parliamentary sovereignty. So where do we stand on that and what, what actually was decided in the judgment? We're very, very lucky tonight to have a panel of four leading experts on the subject. Timothy Endicott, Nick Barber, Alison Young, Paul Craig, all of whom are known to you, I'm sure, either by reputation or by sight. Uh, just before we start, a um, very brief resume of what the case decided. The government claimed that it could trigger Article 50, that is the process of leaving the European Union uh, without going to Parliament and by using its royal prerogative, the prerogative to conduct foreign affairs. Um, the court rejected this argument. It said that the government had to go to Parliament, not just to consult it, but to get legislation. Um, and what about the question of the referendum? As we hear many times, the people have spoken. Do, why did the executive still have to go to Parliament? Well, the court said the referendum was itself a creature of statute, and the statute setting up the referendum did not say, as other referendum statute had, it did not say what should happen uh, with the results of the referendum. And so uh, there was only one way in the current constitutional order that legislation could be changed, and that was through parliamentary legislative process. So the court, by a majority, um, upheld the challenge, and at this very moment, a statute is being debated in a bill, I should say, is being debated in Parliament. It's uh, at its first reading stage. There have been more than 100 amendments <coughs> placed. Um, the government has asked for an expedited procedure so that it will be through all stages, including the House of Lords, by the middle of March, I think. Um, and that means we don't know how much time there will be for these amendments to actually be debated. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, as I say, there's a lot more to be said about the case, and our panellists are going to tell us different aspects. But before we do that, um, I wondered whether we could get just a show of hands from the audience as to whether you welcome the decision or whether you don't welcome the decision, or you're not sure. And I use the word welcome because it doesn't matter what your reasons are, you may welcome it because you've read the decision or because you haven't read the decision, because you were in favour or against, whether you like judges or whether you don't, whether you like executives or you don't, or whether you're just irritated with the whole process and wish everyone would get on with it, you may not welcome it. So I use the word welcome, and of course there may be some of you who haven't made up your mind. I say we, we won't do this again at the end, so it's not like debate and we're not <laughs> seeing who can change whose mind, but should we just have a show of hands from the audience as to who welcomed the decision? <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite a large number. Who didn't welcome it? A decent number. Who had to know who? Evenly balanced. Right. So most people have an opinion, and that's very good. Um, our panel here has we've divided it up as follows. So Nick Barber is going to start by giving an analysis of the majority judgment on the um, the main issue. 
whereas um, Timothy Endicott is going to give an analysis of the descent. And then we're going to turn to Alison Young, who's going to talk about devolution. And I didn't mention part of the judgment which deals with devolution. And um, Paul Craig is going to talk about the significance of the case for now and for the future and future developments. They've each very kindly agreed to talk for exactly 10 minutes. Um, uh, and um, we are, we will hope that everyone will stick within that, which will give us a lot of time for questions afterwards. Um, uh, so can I just mention also that this event is being live streamed? And we will archive it afterwards on the Oxford Human Rights Hub website, where you can also find quite a lot of blogs about Brexit, and on the uh, Oxford University uh, the Law Faculty website, you can find other blogs on Brexit. So I'll start then with Nick Barber. Over to you. Right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. On the morning of the 24th of June last year, I had a surprise. I woke up in Jeff King's house. But that wasn't the surprise, <laughs> because I'd fallen asleep there the night before. The surprise was I discovered that the British people had decided to leave the European Union. I was surprised! But I wasn't the only one who was surprised, not by a long chalk. <laughs> In quick succession, a series of politicians took to the television to voice their surprise. And rather reminiscent of some sort of Greek play, we had a nice range of different forms of surprise to observe. First up, there was Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. They were surprised, much in the same way that a man who decides to warm up his bath with an electric toaster might be surprised. <laughs> they looked like the least happy victors of a referendum I've ever seen. Then Jeremy Corbyn appeared. He looked surprised. But his surprise was different, more like that of a man who'd guessed the winning numbers for the National Lottery, thought he'd forgotten to mail them in, but then finds out, to his delight, that he has. He looked like the happiest loser of a referendum I've ever seen. Finally, and most piquantly, there was the hurt surprise of David Cameron. His surprise was that of a captain who, have, having delivered the inspiring speech, charges into battle, only to find out too late that his troops had decided they'd rather have a nice cup of tea and stay at home. He was the bitterest person to call a referendum I've ever come across. You might be wondering what all this has got to do with the Miller case. Well, quite a bit, as we'll see. At the time of the referendum, I don't think many people thought a leave vote was very likely. The government didn't plan for it, the Brexiteers did not explain either how it would happen or what it would entail, and the opposition's party spent its time doing what it should do, opposing, but opposing each other. The consequence of this is that when the Leave vote came through, no one was quite sure how it could be brought about. It wasn't clear how the United Kingdom could affect Article 50. Sandy has <coughs> outlined the issues very briefly. The central question is clear. Was it possible for the government to trigger Article 50 using the royal prerogative, or was it necessary for Parliament to pass a statute uh, 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 before Article 50 was triggered? So the Miller case revolves around the relationship between prerogative and statute. Before turning to the detail of the majority decision in Miller, the area I've been asked to focus on this evening, um, there are three points I'd like to make about the decision. The first one is obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. This was nothing to do with the merits of Brexit. These poor, innocent souls who decided the High Court case weren't trying to stop Brexit from happening. They weren't opposing Brexit. They were simply upholding Parliament's position in the Constitution. Second, and this will be a disappointment to you, I know, this is a boring case. It's a dull case. The outcome of the case was obvious right from the very start of litigation. Although maybe some on the panel will disagree. <laughs> maybe. For me, this is a case that applied pre-existing rules of constitutional law 
to a slightly unusual <coughs> set of facts. I'm proud to say that Jeff King and uh, Tom Hickman and I wrote a blog before all this started, which I think pretty much predicted the final outcome of the case. Those of you who said at the start that they welcomed Miller were right. You are correct. <laughs> you showed a good sound graph of constitutional law. <laughs> Third, and notwithstanding the points I've just been making, the decision of Miller not only squared with constitutional law, it squared with sound constitutional principle. The decision to leave the European Union is the most significant constitutional decision made in this century for many years, perhaps even more significant than the Human Rights Act and the devolution legislation. If the government was right, the Prime Minister could have unilaterally taken us out of the European Union using the royal prerogative at any point since 1973, <coughs> on a whim. This, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest to you, runs against our model of the separation of powers in the United Kingdom. It runs against the principle of democracy, and it runs against the principle of the rule of law. Now, as Sandy has told you, I have agreed at gunpoint only to speak for 10 minutes. But if you would like me to talk more about those principles, I'm happy to do so. There are two arguments at the heart of the majority decision in the case of Miller. An argument about the priority of rights conferred by the 1972 Act, a rights argument, and an argument about the point of the 1972 Act, the, the point argument. Either of these two arguments would be uh, 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 sufficient for Miller to win. <coughs> the first of these arguments rests on one of the classic cases of the common law, a case found on every, well, probably every, undergraduate reading this, the case of proclamations in 1610. That case held that the king could not use the royal prerogative to remove common law or statutory rights held by his subject. At paragraph 83 of the judgment, the Supreme Court finds that a loss of European law rights, such as the right to equal treatment, rights under the Working Time Directive, etc., 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 would be enough to trigger the principle. The prerogative could not be used to remove these rights. Now, it's a curiosity of the ruling that the Supreme Court did not consider these rights statutory rights. The Supreme Court interpreted the 1972 Act as creating a new source of law, European law. That's fine, that's right. I agree with that. The 1972 Act did create a new source of law. But they went on from this to conclude that the rights generated from this source did not have its, their base in the 72 statute. They weren't statutory rights. Well, I would disagree with this interpretation. I would regard these European law rights as falling under the statute. Their legal validity can be traced back to the Act and for that reason, it's appropriate to call them statutory rights. As it stands, this might be the only truly novel part of Miller. The only truly novel part of Miller, in that Miller expanded the reach of the principle found in the case of proclamations from common law rights and statutory rights to include uh, European rights as well. In all of those cases, the Crown can't use the royal prerogative to strip its citizens of rights only Parliament uh, uh, can keep its goal. The explanation for this characterisation of European law rights is to be found in the second argument um, given by the Supreme Court, that the use of the royal prerogative would strip the 1972 Act of meaning. This argument builds on the Fire Brigade Union case in 1995. In short, ministers cannot use the prerogative to frustrate the point of st statute or to deprive statute of effectual operation. I'll repeat that because it's so important. The fire brigade ministers cannot use the royal prerogative to frustrate the purpose of a statute or to deny a statute effectual operation. The Supreme Court found that the 1972 Act, one minute, I'm almost there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I've cut out some of the more rambling stuff that I was going to do at the beginning, which I might find a way to sneak in later. <laughs> um, the Supreme Court concluded that the use of the royal prerogative in this context would strip the statute of its meaning. It would denude the statute of significance. 
The opposing argument made by the government rather sweetly contended that the 1972 Act was neutral as to our membership of the European Union, and so its purpose would not be frustrated by its exit. <laughs> I, 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 I heard Clive Coleman trying to explain this to an incredulous Eddie Mayer on the Today, uh, on the uh, PM programme. It is, I venture to suggest, the sort of old-fashioned formalism only a professor of private law could find attractive. <laughs> Weekly public lawyers are above such things. I will make three final points about Miller before sitting down. Just three. Number one, the discussion of constitutional statutes is, I think, not directly relevant to the decision. The principles of law being applied from proclamations of fire brigade union would apply to any statute. It wasn't a special case. Number two, I don't believe Miller went far enough in his treatment of the Seoul Convention. The Supreme Court should have issued a declaration that the Seoul Convention was in play, even though they rightly concluded they couldn't enforce it. I can discuss that further later if you like. Thirdly and finally, do you remember the surprised happiness of Jeremy Corbyn? Thanks to Miller, Parliament now has a chance to reconsider many of the issues around Brexit. Even whilst accepting the outcome of the referendum, there are a myriad of ways in which Parliament could condition the way in which Brexit happened. But I'm afraid we may have a Prime Minister and an opposition who are as of one mind on this issue, that Brexit should occur as quickly as possible. And I'm afraid <coughs> the Miller case may have much less impact we might all have hoped. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I um, misled Professor Fredman into thinking I was going to analyze the reasons for the three dissenting judges in the Miller case. I don't need to. Uh, read paragraph 177 of the judgment. It's an unanswerable. You and I today um, have rights under European Union law, and because of two things. One is the fact that the United Kingdom is a member state of the European Union, and the other is that Parliament has acted to give effect to those to the rights that arise under European Union law in English law, and we need those, both of those. Uh, two things, and we are a member state of the mem of the European <coughs> Union because of the uh, the treaty, and uh, the gov the par Parliament of the United Kingdom did nothing at any point, not in the European Union Act 1972, and never since, to take away from what the majority says is the government's power over treaties. Of the two <coughs> arguments for the majority that Nick Garber mentioned, um, the first is not a good argument. The case of proclamations would apply directly if Theresa May's government tried to act as if you and I don't have those rights under European <coughs> Union law, while Britain is a member state of the European Union, and while the Act of Parliament is in effect giving, giving us those rights in English law. And she doesn't propose to do that. The second argument is vacuous. There's a third argument in paragraph 82, and I think it is in the most uh, constructive interpretation of the remarkably careful and ingenious reasons for the majority, the best we can do to justify what they did. And it is we cannot accept, we eight judges cannot accept that a major change to our UK constitutional arrangements can be achieved by ministers alone. Uh, they say the ordinary application of basic concepts of constitutional law to the present issue leads to that conclusion. That is shorthand for there is no authority for this proposition. The proposition is this is too important. This treaty is too important. The government can withdraw treaties. The government can withdraw treaties after they have changed people's rights in UK law. You'll find that in paragraphs 52 to 54. But this one is too constitutionally important. I want, uh, that's all I need to say about, about the judgment. I agree with uh, Nick that it's obvious. 
of what the right outcome is. And Lord Reed, and it's not just paragraph under 77, that's the summary, read it. It's unanswerable and meticulous and, and gives a picture of what Parliament was doing in the 1972 European Communities Act that's simply accurate. That's, that's what Parliament did. Now, in the time I, that remains, I want to comment briefly on the implications of this decision for the famous constitutional principles that you hear about when you study for constitutional law for law mods. I'm going to add one that you haven't heard about. The, the ones you've heard about are parliamentary sovereignty, respect for human rights, the rule of law, the separation of powers, and the fifth that they don't talk about. Nobody talks about except John Locke did a little bit. William Blackstone did rather regrettably, the first professor of English law. Um, effective, accountable, democratic executive government. Parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, what is parliamentary sovereignty? Dicey said the right to make or unmake. This is paragraph 43 of the Miller case. The right to make or unmake any law whatsoever. Well, that's absurd. Parliament doesn't have the right to make or unmake any law, any law whatsoever. And further, no person or body is recognized by the law as having a right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. That's, that's our constitutional law. And it's irrelevant to the case. It is a principle that enables Parliament to decide what to decide. It is not a principle that Parliament needs to decide this. And it's not a principle that Parliament needs to decide something if it's constitutionally important. So parliamentary sovereignty is irrelevant. And, and to do them credit, the majority do not actually make their decision depend on that. Respect for human rights. Um, how about this? Uh, Brexit is standing in the way of Theresa May's earlier inclination to take steps to withdraw the, European, the, the United Kingdom from the European Convention on Human Rights. And anything you can do to mess up and protract the process of Brexit is going to keep that off the agenda. Um, last week, the, the government was letting the newspapers know that they're not interested in having a go at the European Convention on Human Rights. So you might say, Miller, if it makes Brexit more complicated, um, protects the United Kingdom from political moves to withdraw us from the European Convention on Human Rights. The rule of law? Go on the Supreme Court website, and I just noticed this the other day. It's extraordinary. In their emblem, there is a giant omega. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. I'm sure that's no mistake. They're saying this is, this is final, and you might think that there's a problem for the rule of law if they make a decision that's patently wrong and there's no recourse from it. And in fact, on the contrary, it's compatible with the rule of law to have a governmental institution, namely a court, that can decide how <coughs> we're going to go forward, finally, without any recourse, and we need it to be an institution to which the government gives respect when it's wrong. Um, Every decision against the government, you might say, is a good thing in the sense that it shows that the government is subject to law. So you might say there's a sort of rule of, ben rule of law benefit even when the court decides wrongly if it's against the government. What about the separation of powers? Separation of powers includes the principle of the independence of the judiciary. And this case is a beautiful little picture of the independence of the judiciary. I think it's fortunate for the country's political culture that there was a dissent. You might say that's the best thing about the dissent. It shows something important for the separation of powers, something important for the independence of judges. We need them not only to be independent from Theresa May and look at them, that's patent. We need them to be independent of each other. And I think it's healthy for the country's political culture that the Daily Mail can't look at that 96 pages and say, look at this cabal of judges who are against the people. Um, so that's something very constructive for the independence of the judiciary that you see in the decision in the Miller case. What about effective, accountable, democratic executive government? Well, this is the reason why, even though they're right, the majority are right, that the treaties and our membership in the European Union are of great constitutional importance. This is why Lord Reed, Lord Carnot, and Lord Hughes were right not to fall for the idea 
that because the issue is constitutionally important, it must be for Parliament, not for the courts. That's not a legal argument, by the way. It is potentially an argument for the judges to change things and take away from the executive a power that is constitutionally bad for them to have. It's not constitutionally bad for the British government to have the power to trigger Article 50. And it would not have been constitutionally damaging if the decision had been decided the other way. We need, as a community, to act as a person, as a, as a community, acting as a community in international relations. And the allocation of power over treaties to the government accomplishes that. It needs to be accountable, and it is. As, as Lord Carnwell said, Parliament can interfere any way it likes with what's going on in Brexit. And Parliament's all over Brexit, by the way. It's not as if Parliament wasn't involved, but now it will have to be involved. But I want to point out that it's not just that the Theresa May's government is accountable. Theresa May's government is a democratic executive. People talk in the argument in the case as if we're dealing with King James shaking his fist at Sir Edward Cook. We are not dealing with an executive that is an arbitrary monarch. We are dealing with an executive that is more tenderly and more sensitively aware to and responsive to the wishes of the people than Parliament itself. And of course, that sensitivity and, and tender awareness of what the people want is the reason why many people don't want the government making this decision. Good evening. I, I get the lucky job in that I don't have to argue for or against the majority of the minority, but to pick up on some of the other parts of the judgment. So I've been asked to focus not just on devolution, but possible consequences for rights and human rights protection. So what I want to say with regard to devolution is just to clarify some of the information that's out there and discuss the ins and outs of how it came up and what the consequences are. So I think it's important to recognise that the main argument came up on the basis of if we do have to have legislation, so there is no property power, should there be some form of involvement of the devolved legislature? There's a range of arguments, the main one being because we have the civil convention in some way, A, does this trigger any form of legal duty to consult? And there are arguments looking at that on the basis, particularly with regard to Scotland, because of the impact of Section 2 of the Scotland Act 2016, which, if you're really fascinated, modifies Section 28.8 of the Scotland Act 1998. So you can go away and look it up. Uh, but also, they were arguing with regard to saying, would these requirements amount to a constitutional requirement? So they're arguing, is it not, even if it's a convention, would that also make it a constitutional requirement? And if so, would that be relevant for the purposes of Article 50? So that's the kind of range of arguments that came up with regard to devolution. What the court was very, very careful to do was to delineate between the legal and the political. So the court looks at it and says, OK, if we're looking broadly at the civil convention, there's an important word there, convention. Because it's a convention, they have this wonderful phrase, we can observe it, we can observe conventions, but we are not the parents of conventions, and we are not the guardians of conventions. So the courts can look at what's happening and observe whether the convention is there, but they're not the parents, they don't create it, they're not the guardians, they don't enforce it. So what the court does is it says, okay, that's political. It then looks at the Scotland Act and it says, because this is recognising a convention, we see this as a legislative intent to say, this is a convention. So they have this phrase about it's entrenching it as a convention. So, and I agree with Nick, they could have done more with regard to section two, and we can perhaps discuss that in the questions, but that's what the court did. Why am I stressing that? For two reasons. The court did not say that there is no need for a legislative consent motion here total. 
They said legally there is no legal requirement for a legislative consent motion. It's a political question whether you need it or not. They also made an observation in their capacity as observers that legislative consent motions have been used not just with regards to legislation by Westminster on devolved matters, but also <coughs> with regard to legislation which would alter the competences <coughs> of devolved legislatures or devolved administrators. And if you want to know what that is, it's paragraph 140 of the judgment. Why is that important? Because this is an observation of things that have happened. So it's sending a message in some senses. It's not saying, you know, this is what we think. It's saying, look, this is what we've observed. And that's information that the political actors can go away and use <coughs> politically to decide whether they think there should be a legislative consent motion or whether there should be any kind of interaction. And that's not for the government in its explanatory notes to say, we don't think you need one, or to say, therefore, there isn't one because the court concluded this isn't a devolved matter. The government can pronounce what it thinks, but it's a political issue for all the political actors to get involved in to see whether it's there or not. Okay. And I think that's important because the Sewell Convention, as the court recognised, plays a very important role in maintaining harmonious relationships between Westminster and the devolved bodies. So it's going to continue to do that when the political actors need to continue to talk about it and not just accept that what the court says legally necessarily determines whether the Civil Convention applies or not. The second aspect I was um, asked to talk about was with regard to human rights, or rights more generally. As I've heard pointed out in the judgment, one of the reasons for the conclusion the Supreme Court reached was that one of the consequences, they said, of triggering Article 50 is you'd set in train a process which would, at some stage, remove rights. And there had been a concession by the government in the Divisional Court, which wasn't questioned in the Supreme Court, that there would be a loss of some rights that you find in European Union law. And that was an extra element of the decision. I think there are other aspects of the decision that are important when we're thinking about how far we're protecting rights in the future. The court showed an awareness of the different nature of rights that you get from European Union law. It recognised that they get interpreted by the European Court of Justice, and those interpretations are binding on UK courts. It also recognised that in European Union law they have a fundamental status. So those of you who do constitutional law are fully aware of the primacy of directly effective provisions of European Union law. They can be used to disapply legislation. So they can form a constitutional backstop to protect these particular rights. Why do I think these points are important? Well, I don't think that an argument is occurring between the majority who thought rights are lovely and the minority who thought, oh, I don't like rights. In fact, if you go away and read Lord Carmen's dissent, he's very clear at stressing the importance of the rights involved and he's fully aware of the impact. But what they're arguing about in some senses is how that plays out <coughs> in the political arena. For Lord Carnworth, he says, but there's parliamentary accountability, there's going to be parliamentary debate, there's going to be discussion. Parliamentary institutions will hold the executive to account. But the consequences of the majority decision, it's not just about holding to account. You have to go to Parliament to ask for the power to act. And as anyone who's read the amendments, and yes, it's, they have, sorry, will see, they could perform an interesting and important role. They're not just there with regard to democratic debate and more information. There are also other amendments that are saying we want this power to be conditional on preserving some of those rights. We've had political statements from Theresa May about preserving workers' rights, the rights of UK citizens living in other EU countries, the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. So, does that mean there's sufficient political will to make those conditions of how we exercise our power? So we want some legal conditions on whether the withdrawal agreement that we end up with does or does not protect those rights. And I'm not necessarily saying 
what the outcome should be. What I'm saying is one important element of this is this enables Parliament to debate whether it thinks there should be these protections of these rights. And for me, that forms an important safeguard. So that's one reason I have for welcoming the majority decision. I fully accept that you have an executive government that's accountable to Parliament, but sometimes I think accountability might not necessarily be enough. Sometimes I think you need Parliament to debate whether it's going to put conditions on the exercise of the power, particularly if that might have an impact on rights. Thank you very much. very much indeed. Um, I'm playing kind of sweeper in this enterprise. Uh, so, um, let me say the following. We know that the Supreme Court in Miller upheld the earlier decision of the Divisional Court and held that the government could not trigger Article 50 to begin the process of withdrawing from the EU without obtaining statutory authorization from Parliament. <coughs> The result was widely predicted, with the media estimating that the Supreme Court would divide 7-4 in favour of the claim. That was pretty accurate, given that the ruling turned out to be 8-3. I think the divergence was merely that the Russian hackers only had their B team out at the time, <laughs> given that they were busy hacking Sherlock Holmes and getting ready to hack the Francois Fillon uh, candidacy for the French presidency. <laughs> the Miller decision has already achieved its place in the history books, being the most blogged about case in the UK. It is a record that will not easily be broken. The spectre of justice being conducted in media real time has become the new reality, bearing affinity to the way in which we conduct other areas of life ranging from politics to war. The ratings for the Supreme Court televised hearings may not yet have, have usurped more traditional TV classics, but reality TV producers will assuredly see the potential of such hearings, <laughs> although they may struggle to render arguments concerning fallacious constitutional synergisms appealing <laughs> to the wider public. So, two points then, or two kinds of points about Mill. Firstly, on the legal side, and then I'm going to look at the slightly broader perspective. On the legal side, meaning the actual judgment itself. My view is actually not the same as Nick, and it's not the same as Timothy either, in the following sense. I think this is a case which is really interesting. I think this is a case which is really important for constitutional law. And I'm going to tell you why I think it's important, though I can't possibly go into what I think about the contending arguments. The reason it's really important, and the reason it's really fun when you get into it, is this. We work in the common law through a case-based system, and the cases reflect certain principles. So as constitutional lawyers, as professors, as text writers, as article writers, as lecturers, we all work within a system in which we say, yes, we have this royal prerogative and it has certain limitations. And one kind of limitation is from proclamations, and that you can't use the prerogative to alter the law of the land or affect rights. The other kind of limitation is from de Kaiser, where if statutes are covering the same terrain as the prerogative, then the prerogative has to fall or stand in abeyance. Now, the real reason why Miller is such an interesting case and deserves very close scrutiny is that what it does is that it forces us in a way which we have not done or had to do for a long time to test the meets and bounds of those respective propositions. What does it mean to say 
that an exercise of the prerogative alters the law of the land or affects rights? What is the boundary of the De Keyser principle? Now, I think the answer to both of those questions is difficult. I do not think that there is an easy slam dunk answer either way. I do, I have great respect for the dissent of Lord Reed, and I entirely agree with Timothy. I think it's good that there was a dissent of that intellectual calibre in the case, because it poses the challenge and requires us to ask ourselves very hard about the twin propositions and the ambit of those twin propositions, proclamations on the one hand and de Kaiser on the other. I do not, however, think that Power 177 or any other single para is in any way conclusive in this particular case. And indeed, I think the only way in which you get to resolve the boundaries of those respective propositions is actually by peering behind them and actually inquiring into the values which inform those propositions respectively. So that's all I'm going to say about the immediate judgment. Let me just say then, and spend the remainder of my time, about Miller in political and legal perspective. Political perspective. I think that the ruling will not markedly upset the government's avowed timetable for triggering Article 50. The Prime Minister almost certainly has a short bill already drafted. It's a bit like one of these cookery programs. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, and out it comes. If you don't like that one, I've got another one. A shorter one, a longer one. Okay. And indeed, t but two days after the government lost in the Supreme Court, the European Union notification of withdrawal bill was introduced. It was a short bill, and that was predicted as well. Now, the next two weeks, we'll see attempts to place procedural and substantive limitations on the government. Time will tell how successful that proves to be. I think, given the politics as we know them in Parliament at present, I think the chances of substantive limitations are quite scant. I think the chances of procedural limitations are a bit better though how meaningful they'll be remains to be seen. I think it will be important to know whether Parliament does get a final word on a withdrawal agreement which is produced sometime towards the end of two years from here. Legal perspective. There is, Miller is, I repeat, very important for the reasons that I articulate. There's nonetheless a danger of it being overhyped and of a folklore or fairy tale developing almost as we speak. And the fairy tale takes the following form. It takes the form of the court as the saviour of the constitution, and, I've, and I say this on the whole thinking that the majority got it right, so just bear that in mind. As the court as the saviour of the constitution riding valiantly to the rescue of the stricken maiden, that is, Parliament, thereby saving it from the clutches of the wicked dragon, viz. the all-powerful, or executive, uh, the all-powerful executive. Stories are good, but they must comport with reality and not undermine constitutional principle. There is a real danger of constitutional solicism here. Sovereignty resides with Parliament, and has done so for over three centuries. It does not reside with the executive. It is therefore, amongst all these arguments, one argument stands out as unassailable, which is this. It would have been open to Parliament at any time since the 23rd of June to enact a statute requiring the government to seek its approval before triggering Article 50. If it had done so, it would have been game over. The specific statute would indubitably have trumped the prerogative in this instance. Parliament did, that, did not, therefore, need to await <coughs> rescue 
by the bold legal prints on its white charger. That begs the question as to why Parliament was quiescent in this respect, to which the answer is, of course, political and eclectic. Some MPs might genuinely have felt that the issue for reasons of principle should be left to the executive. Others, particularly hard Brexiteers, were committed functionally to the prerogative since they were concerned in the aftermath of the referendum at attempts to undo their victory on the floor of the House. But, of course, the principal explanation as to why most MPs were not clamouring for, in inverted commas, voice through enactment of the statute was, in reality, rather different. They were fearful of backlash from their constituents who had voted to leave, who would be angered if they felt that their victory was in danger of being undermined by demands for such a statute. It was then much easier for MPs to remain largely silent, such that demands for parliamentary voice rarely rose above a whisper. For most MPs, political discretion was preferable to constitutional valour, such that they were content to rely on the courts through the instrumentality of the Miller judgment to give Parliament voice without the attendant political dangers of actively seeking. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to our, our panel for a, a really scintillating discussion. I think we've had a, 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 an absolute feast. Everyone was also very good about saying what they were going to say briefly and concisely, which has left us a good amount of time, probably up to half an hour, for questions and responses. Can I say we going to stop the live streaming at this point so that people can ask questions freely and answer them. But just to remind you that um, we, we, um, this uh, whole panel will be on, our, on the Oxford Human Rights Hub website if you want to revisit it or if you want to tell other people about it. And it will in due course also be on the North Faculty website. So. Um, now we have time for questions, and obviously we've only just, I think, whet everyone's appetite for more discussion about uh, so many different aspects of this decision. What I'm going to do is to have uh, a few rounds of questions, probably three, take three or maybe four questions at a time. Please make your questions brief. Uh, if you want to make a comment, make that brief, but also add a question.